Hey guys, today I'll be taking a look at the 2022 Senate map based on the latest polls. A lot has changed in just the last couple of weeks. The Republican campaigns in both Ohio and Georgia are crumbling. However, on the flip side, Democrats are starting to lose their grip on the race in Nevada. So we have a very dynamic map right here for the 2022 midterms. 36-29 with 35 races on the ballot. We basically have polls from every single state now except for four, and those are only the very solid Democratic and Republican states, but as the midterms are now just 25 days away, I'll be updating the 2022 Senate map based on the latest numbers that we have, and we'll start off in New Hampshire and then go from right to left. And so we're just going to get right into it. In New Hampshire, Maggie Hassan leads by 7.8% against Don Bulldog right now. This election looked like it was going to be very close for quite a while, but Bulldog really was the worst possible nominee for the Republicans to choose. He simply is way too far to the right. And Maggie Hassan, who was only narrowly elected in 2016, the closest election of the year, is now easily on track to winning a second term in office. Every single poll so far has shown that Maggie Hassan defeating Don Bulldog 5-3. 38 gives her an 84% chance at doing so. And of course, in 2020, Democrats won the Senate seat in New Hampshire by 15 points. So Maggie Hassan is going to easily win her re-election with New Hampshire being a likely Democratic state. Next up in Vermont, we're seeing Peter Welch also on track to winning his election against Gerald Malloy. Now, Welch would only be the second Democratic senator from Vermont in history, succeeding Patrick Leahy, who will be retiring at the beginning of 2023. Bernie Sanders is technically an independent, even though he's run for the Democratic nomination for president twice. So Peter Welch will only be the second Democratic senator from one of the oldest states in the union. And Welch led by 34 points in the latest poll, but only seven, according to H.R. Fowler poll that this poll is obviously going to be wrong. Peter Welch is going to win very easily in the most Democratic state in the country. Joe Biden won Vermont by 35% in 2020, so Vermont is obviously going to be very solid for the Democratic Party. We also have a race that Democrats are easily going to win in Connecticut, where Richard Blumenthal is running for a second term. He's up by 14.7 points against Leora Levy. I think he will end up winning by a solid margin in November. The polls currently have him at just under that 15% mark, so technically it is going to be a likely Democratic state right now, but this race is not going to be competitive at all. Richard Blumenthal is clearly on track to winning a second term in office. Moving on to New York, even though the governor election between Kathy Hochul and Lee Zeldin is pretty close, Chuck Schumer is easily going to win his fifth term in office representing New York in the Senate. He is serving currently alongside Kirsten Gillibrand, and Chuck Schumer is obviously going to win. He's a Senate majority leader. There's really no chance that he loses his re-election. Joe Pinion isn't too special of a Republican candidate either. Kathy Hochul is struggling because she's just very unpopular as the incumbent governor, but Chuck Schumer as the senator is significantly better liked and better known in the Empire State. So New York is going to be solid as Chuck Schumer currently leads by just under 20 points. And so now we're going to move on to the races in the Midwest. We have quite a bit to cover, and the Midwest is still going to be one of the most competitive regions of the year. But I think that in 2022, the region that's going to define which party wins the majority is actually going to be a Sun Belt because we have those major races in North Carolina, Georgia, Arizona, and Nevada. So in Pennsylvania, this is by far the easiest flip for the Democratic Party. Fetterman leads by 6% against Dr. Oz and has led in every single poll ever released for this election. Yes, some polls are showing a closer election than before. Emerson College only had Fetterman up by 2 But in the very end, Memi Oz is just so weak of a candidate that it would be unthinkable that he's going to win this election. Republicans are going to lose the Senate seat in the Keystone State. Pat Toomey is going to retire, and John Fetterman, the Democrat, is is going to succeed him, and this is why Democrats are on track to winning the Senate. If they could not flip Pennsylvania, they would not be in the winning position right now. If you just look at the 538 forecast, John Fetterman now has a 72% chance at winning this election, but things were not always this way. In fact, when this forecast was first released, he only had a 35% chance at winning the race. Nemet Oz was the favorite candidate at one point because this seat is, of course, held by a Republican currently, but things are just not looking good right now for the GOP. Pennsylvania is on track to flipping in favor of the Democratic Party with John Fetterman currently currently leading by a likely margin in the polls. 
Next up, we're actually going to come out of the Rust Belt just a little bit and look at the race in Maryland. Chris Van Holen is running for re-election, and he leads by 23% against Chris Chaffee. The election is not going to be competitive. Chris Van Holen is easily going to win his second term in office after being first elected in 2016. However, Democrats can also win the race in Ohio. So far, Democrats are dominating New England. I don't think Republicans are going to win any races here in the North Atlantic, but in Ohio, this is going to be a very close one between J.D. Vance and Tim Ryan. The polls currently show Tim Ryan in the lead, and he's basically been ahead since the beginning of the month of July by various margins. Now, the most recent polls have shown J.D. Vance to be ahead. These polls were conducted by Signal and Emerson College, but if you looked at these two governor polls, they showed Mike DeWine up by significantly larger margins than usual. I think that Tim Ryan does stand a chance in the Buckeye State. Of course, Democrats already control the other seat in Ohio currently held by Sherrod Brown, who easily won re-election in 2018. Tim Ryan, though, as the non-incumbent, is going to struggle here against Vance just because Vance is a Republican in a state that is continuing to shift to the right. A win for Democrats is going to be a very big deal, and that's why right now I still technically do favor J.D. Vance, but I do think that if things go well for Ryan in the next three weeks, there is a chance that he does actually flip this seat and become a member of the upper chamber of Congress. But right now, just based on the polls alone, he does have a very slight advantage. He's up by 0.2%, making this a tilt Democratic state. And then in Indiana, Republicans are struggling here as well, according to the polling data. Todd Young only up by 2 and 3 percent. Of course, in the end, he's going to win his re-election, but polling data right now is really not on his side. He's only up on average by 2.5 percent against Thomas McDermott. So this election is going to be lean Republican according to just the data, but I think that in the end, he can win by a likely margin. That's what he did in 2016. I think that there was a chance that he was going to win by over 15 points, but this new polling data really does doubt that possibility. Next up in Kentucky, Rand Paul is up by 16 points against Charles Booker. Booker ran for the Democratic nomination for Senate to run against Mitch McConnell in 2020. He eventually lost to Amy McGrath, but Charles Booker is the more progressive of the candidate, and I don't think he is going to perform well against Paul, even though Rand Paul is pretty unpopular in his state. It's still a solid red state, and so he's easily going to win his second term. And just like Todd Young in Indiana, Rand Paul also did not win by a solid margin in 2016, but the polling currently does suggest that he will win by just over 15 points. Next up in Wisconsin, the most competitive Senate election in the Midwest this year. Ron Johnson is running for re-election. In 2016, he won with a surprise victory against Russ Feingold by 3.4%. The polls did show him losing his re-election, but he did win a second term by a pretty large margin considering what polling was predicting. And right now, Ron Johnson is doing better in the polls than he was six years ago. He's up by 2.9% against Mandela Barnes after taking the lead in mid-September. I do think he is on track to winning his re-election to now a third term. And Della Barnes is running a pretty mediocre campaign. Ron Johnson is really bombarding the Democrat with a ton of ads, and he does have money in the state. He is a long-time incumbent. He's had 12 years, basically, to fundraise for this election. So Ron Johnson currently up 2.9%. Wisconsin is going to be leading Republican, and not a state that I think they're going to lose this year. In Illinois, Tammy Duckworth is going to easily win her re-election. She defeated incumbent Mark Kirk by a solid margin in 2016. This is only one of two flips for the Democratic Party that year, the other one, of course, being in New Hampshire. But, of course, after the 2022 elections, Duckworth will become a two-term senator, and she's going to easily win that second term this year against Kathy Salvi. Next up in Iowa, we do have a surprisingly close election, just like the one that we have in Indiana. It will probably not be solid Republican this year, even though Chuck Grassley is running for his eighth term. As he's gotten older, he has gotten tougher and tougher challenges from his Democratic opponents, and Michael Franken, who lost the 2020 Democratic nomination to challenge Joni Ernst two years ago, is now running for a second time and is running against the incumbent Chuck Grassley. Now, Michael Franken is a former Navy Vice Admiral and is running a pretty strong campaign. Chuck Grassley is in the closest election he's been in since his first one all the way back in 1980. I think that Grassley is obviously going to win, 538, in fact, gives him a solid chance of doing so. 99 in 100 that Grassley wins for an eighth time. But this election will be interesting to watch because it will be the closest election Grassley has been in for almost half a century. And so Iowa is currently only going to be likely according to the polling. 
We also have another likely Republican state here in Missouri, where Eric Schmidt is running to succeed Roy Blunt, who will also be retiring at the beginning of 2023. Trudy Bush Valentine is the Democratic nominee. I think Schmidt can win by a solid margin, but right now polls are currently suggesting only a margin of 11.5%, which will make the state of Missouri a second likely Republican state here in the Midwest. And so now, before we move on to the West, we're going to go over the races in the Deep South. So starting off here in North Carolina, Ted Budd is running against Sherry Beasley, and this is going to be a very competitive election. This, of course, is to fill the seat that will be vacated by Richard Burr, who won by a likely margin back in 2016. And so Ted Budd against Sherry Beasley, they're both pretty generic candidates for both parties. They're both pretty representative of where the center of both parties are right now. And North Carolina is one of the most competitive states in the country. Country, but in a year like 2022, it probably is not going to be the year the Democrats win it. The last time Democrats won a Senate election in the Tar Heel State was back in 2008 when Kay Hagan defeated Elizabeth Dole, and that was the same year the Democrats last won North Carolina in a presidential election with, of course, the victory of Barack Obama. So right now, Democrats are probably not going to flip North Carolina. It has been a lot closer than expected. Sherry Beasley is running a pretty strong campaign, but in the end, she's probably not going to do enough to win her election, which means Ted Bott will be elected as the new senator from North Carolina, and currently he is expected to win by a lean margin of victory. In neighboring South Carolina, despite Lindsey Graham only winning by 10 points in 2020 against Jamie Harrison, we're going to see a much stronger margin of victory for Tim Scott as he runs against Kirsten Matthews. Scott is up by 17 points in the polls here. South Carolina is going to be solid. I do think Scott can win by over 20 points this November. And then in Georgia, we have a race that Democrats are doing better and better in. This is, of course, the election between Raphael Warnock and Herschel Walker. And this is one of the two most important elections this year, the other one being the election in Nevada. If Republicans win Georgia, they have a very good chance at winning back the Senate. But right now, Democrats are favored. And if they can carry this race for a second time in a row, they will have an over 90% chance at retaining control of the upper chamber. So right now, Ralphie Warnock is up by 3.9%, his largest margin ever, as, of course, the recent scandal that hit Herschel Walker's campaign is really starting to hurt. Herschel Walker losing his election, I don't think is too much of a surprise. He's always been a terrible candidate and something that Republicans never should have nominated. If Herschel Walker did not win this nomination, Republicans probably would win this election. Herschel Walker's own campaign poll only has him ahead by 2%, and the latest Trafalgar Group poll actually has Warnock up by 2% against Walker. Things are looking out for the Democratic Party here, and that's why they're the favored party in Georgia now, as Raphael Warnock is on track to winning the second Senate seat the Democrats won in the 2021 runoff. John Ossoff, of course, being the other Democratic senator who will serve until 2027. In the sunshine state of Florida, Republicans are probably going to favor as a result of Hurricane Ian hitting the state just a month before the election. Of course, my prayers are with those who have been affected, but the election is basically stopped at this point as Val Demings and Charlie Crist have no chance to campaign in favor of themselves, as of course that would seem like really just not a good move against the Republican incumbents who are in office. Incumbents typically win when bad things strike a certain state or the entire country, like we saw with 9-11. Republicans did great in the 2002 midterms after the 9-11 attacks. And so we're probably going to see something like this in Florida as well, although of course not too extreme of a scale that 9-11 was. But when disasters hit, people normally rally around their existing leaders. And so that's why Marco Rubio and Ron DeSantis are both going to easily win re-election. I think Rubio will win by over 5%, but the polls right now only suggest a lean margin of victory with Rubio up by 4.6%. Now we don't actually have polls from Alabama. This is the first out of the four states on this map they don't have data from, but it's going to be a solid victory for Katie Britt, who will succeed Richard Shelby. And so now we have seven very solid races for the GOP that I'm going to try to get over fairly quickly here. So in Arkansas, Republicans are up by a likely margin as John Boozman only leads against Natalie James by 13 points. In Louisiana, they're doing significantly better as John Kennedy is on track to winning in the first round without a runoff. He is at 50% in the two polls and leads on average by 36% against the Democrats that he will be facing. There are no primary elections in Louisiana. Every single candidate is basically on the ballot in November. And then if no candidate wins a majority, 
there will be a runoff a month later. So, but Louisiana right now looks like that John Kennedy is going to win his re-election without needing a runoff. In North Dakota, we don't have polls here, but Mike Rounds is going to easily win re-election. But in South Dakota, we do have some polls with John Thune currently up on average by 19% against Brian Bangs. This election is not going to be close at all, nor is the election in Kansas, where Jerry Moran is currently up by 17.3% against Mark Holland. He's also going to win by a solid margin. I think it will probably be at least over 20 points. And then in the two elections in Oklahoma, between Mark Wayne Mullen and his Democratic challenger, as well as James Lankford and the Democrat challenging him, both Republicans are on track to winning, but James Lankford is only up by 15 points in the polls, while on the Senate election side, we're seeing that Mark Wayne Mullen only leads on average by 11% against Kendra Horn. So these elections are both going to be races that Republicans are going to easily win, but polling right now is not exactly the most favorable for the GOP here, as the special election is actually currently only likely Republican, according to the recent data that we have. And now moving on to Colorado, where you have a little bit more competitive of a race between Joe Adea and Michael Bennett. Bennett currently leads by 7.9% in the polls, and is pretty much on track to winning for a third time. Now, in 2016, he won by 6 points. I think that if he does better than he did 6 years ago, Democrats will have a good night. But if he does worse, Democrats should worry about their margins in states like Georgia, Arizona, and Pennsylvania. But right now, things are looking good for Michael Bennett. He is easily on track to winning his third full term in office. He was was first appointed all the way back in 2009. And then in Utah, I think we have the most interesting election in the West here, and that of course is the race between Mike Lee and Evan McMullen. MAGA Republicans are not popular in the state. Trump did not even win a majority of the votes in Utah in 2016, because McMullen, running as a conservative independent, actually gained 22% of the share in the Beehive State that year. And now he's running against Lee, a pretty weak incumbent. He only served one term so far. And so McMullen, who's at 39%, really does have a chance at making this election very interesting. In fact, the latest poll actually shows McMullen ahead by 6% against Mike Lee. Now, this is a super PAC sponsoring McMullen, but it's still going to be a race that we're going to watch pretty closely just because of the fact that Utah, for the very first time in the 21st century, is going to have a competitive election. So Evan McMullen is making a dent here against Lee, and that's why Utah right now is only barely likely Republican. We do not have polls yet from Idaho, nor do we have them from Hawaii, but we do have polls from every other state that is left on this map. So in Arizona, Mark Kelly is on track to winning re-election. He's up by 6.3% against Blake Masters. I don't think this race is going to be too competitive either, although Mark Kelly is probably going to underperform polling expectations. He did so in 2020, and even though he did, he still won by 2%. Arizona is still going to be a very competitive state, but Blake Masters was a mistake to be nominated by the GOP. If they had chosen somebody much more generic, they would have a much better chance. Mark Kelly is still a relatively strong incumbent, but Mark Kelly, as a very weak GOP nominee, is not helping the Republican Party at all in this race. And so, as a result of, once again, poor nominee choice by the Republicans, Mark Kelly is on track to winning re election in Arizona, just like Warnock is in Georgia, and just like John Fetterman is on track to flipping the Keystone state of Pennsylvania. However, Nevada right now seems to be the only state that Republicans have a good chance of flipping, and that is, of course, in the election between Adam Laxalt and Catherine Cortez Masto. Latina voters are moving away from the Democratic Party, and even though Masto is the first Latina senator in American history, that does not really seem to be helping her too much in this election. Luxalt has recently taken the lead, and he's now up by 0.7%, despite Masto being ahead from the months of May all the way until late October. And so the most recent polls have mainly showed Luxalt winning this election. He was, of course, the failed Republican candidate for governor in 2018, but at this point, it looks like he may win his Senate seat representing the state. He's the former Attorney General, and he does have a family history in politics in the Silver State. But right now, I do think that Luxalt has has the very slight advantage, and polls currently have him up by just a tilt margin, which I do think is pretty accurate for this race, at least at this point in time. And we'll have to see whether or not Masto can take this race back. She is still very much in the election. She's still the incumbent who won by two points in 2016, but the election is going to be significantly harder. The national environment in 2022 simply is not what it was six years ago. 
And then, of course, the three Western states are going to easily go to the Democratic Party. Washington will be likely, though. Murray is only up by 9.8% against Tiffany Smiley. This election may be closer than usual, but Patty Murray will still win her fifth term in office. And then in Oregon, Ron Wyden leads by 20 points against Jerry Perkins. And in California... Alex Padilla is up by 22 points against Mark Muser. Padilla was appointed to the Senate in 2021 after Kamala Harris became a vice president, so this will be the first election for Alex Padilla as the incumbent, and so he will still though, win by a solid margin, as of course California is one of the most liberal states in the country. And finally, in Alaska, Lisa Murkowski is ahead by 5.7% against Kelly Shibaka. This race will still be solid Republican because in the end, it will still be a Republican that will win. But Kelly Shibaka is the Trump-endorsed candidate that ran against Murkowski. And in the ranked choice voting election, Murkowski has a significantly better chance. If you look at most of the first-round votes, Shibaka is actually in the lead with her at 46%. But in the final round, she only goes up to 50 because Democratic voters as well as independent voters will likely sway in favor of Murkowski pretty significantly and against the far-right Shibaka. So right now, Alaska is going to be solid Republican, but it will just matter who wins between Shibaka and Murkowski. And so this is the 2022 Senate map based on the latest polls. Obviously, it is not my prediction, but I think that this map really does show the Democrats are the favored party right now. 538 still favors them to win the majority for a second time, and currently they are at 51 seats according to the data, with them flipping both Ohio and Pennsylvania, while Republicans see wins in just Nevada. And so many of the elections are going to be very, very close. Polls will probably not be able to predict many of these close races, but they do give us some sort of gauge as to how well both parties are doing and right now, Democrats are still on top. They've lost the leads in Wisconsin, North Carolina, and Nevada, but they're still doing relatively well, considering that they had absolutely no expectations going into the year of 2022. And so the midterms are now just 25 days away, so make sure you stay subscribed to keep updated on all the midterm news from this channel. If you're not subscribed, make sure you do subscribe. Like this video down below if you enjoyed it. Comment down below which party you think will win the majority in 2022, and I'll see you guys in the next video.